Before traffic lights, the automobile, the horse, the buggy, and the pedestrian had to figure out how to navigate the road at the same time. It was dangerous. Two out of every three accidents are caused by errors in human judgment. If you, the living, will drive and walk with courtesy, caution, and common sense, this needless slaughter can be immeasurably reduced. In 1925, cars and trucks killed more than 20,000 Americans. The public started to hate the car. People called drivers joyriders and speed maniacs. They wanted their streets back. In Cincinnati, officials thought speed limits weren't enough. They actually wanted to pass a law saying that cars must come with a device that would automatically turn off an engine if the car hit 25 miles an hour. The law didn't pass, but the car industry still freaked out. Soon, car advocates launched a full-on campaign to make people think pedestrians were the problem, not cars. Their basic message? No, it's not cars that are dangerous. It's those pedestrians who don't know how to cross the street. And so they encouraged the adoption of a new term. I'm sure you know one of the alphabet walkers, the most common one, the jaywalker. The jaywalker. The dictionary says that a jaywalker is someone who crosses the street carelessly without obeying the traffic regulations so that he is endangered by the traffic. They painted jaywalkers as small-town country folk who didn't know anybody. And you know what a jay is? Well, besides being a bird, it also means a silly person. A silly person who was to blame if they were injured by a car. And that is just what the jitter-brain jaywalker is. So don't be a jaywalker, be an A-walker. In Detroit, the Packard Motor Company made a float for a parade that was a gigantic tombstone. The words on it read, Erected to the memory of Mr. J. Walker. He stepped from the curb without looking. And all of this clever marketing really changed people's behaviors. We stopped crossing willy-nilly. We stopped milling around because the street didn't belong to us anymore. It belonged to the cars. And the traffic light was the enforcer of this new order. Pedestrians and drivers alike owe the automatic traffic signal a vote of thanks. When they use it well and treat it right, they are saving time and making it possible for everybody to get on faster and move along in traffic with less wear and tear. But these rules that were imposed with the traffic lights, they didn't just create safety. They also created a hierarchy, with cars at the top. I certainly think that the traffic light brings a certain level of of rules and order and expectations that people share, and that that is a good thing. But that doesn't mean that we should preserve it at all costs. Welcome to City of the Future, a new podcast from Sidewalk Labs. Each episode, we explore one idea or innovation that could transform our cities. I'm Eric Jaffe. And I'm Vanessa Quirk. And on this episode, we're exploring an innovation that could make the streets work better, not just for cars, but for cyclists and pedestrians, too. Adaptive traffic lights. I was told Vanessa was going to interview me. I don't understand why you're here. Because you would have joined Willa Eng has dedicated her professional life to making streets better for everybody. Hi, my name is Willa Eng. I'm the director of mobility for streets at Sidewalk Labs. Before Sidewalk Labs, she worked for the New York City's Department of Transportation and for the city of Berkeley. But she was obsessed with mobility way before she landed her first job. What was that thing that you started in high school? Oh, I'm sorry. Are you talking about the Student Transportation Task Force, the STTF? I know it's probably internationally renowned. I it, apologize. It, was, it literally was me sort of asking around who else is coming to school and taking the train and what's your schedule and do you want to take the train together? So, so the technology in this case was you and like a pen and paper? Yes. It was, it was an on-demand dispatch service, except the dispatch algorithm was me. At Sidewalk, Will has been thinking a lot about traffic lights and how they could change the hierarchy of the street. She wants streets that work for everyone, whether you're in a car, a bus, bike, wheelchair, or just walking around. So Willa, when you're thinking about how to make streets safer for everybody, what are your priorities here? What are your goals? I think I would create a hierarchy of users for an intersection based on how vulnerable that user is. I would optimize first for safety and then person, the, the, the phrase is person throughput which is how can we just get as many people as possible through that intersection? 
it's nerdy. That's a nerdy answer because that's like officially a, a term. <laughs> it was a wonderful answer. <laughs> well, I think that what's really exciting is that we're sort of changing the conversation and thinking to ourselves, what is the best way to get as many people through the intersection with as minimal delay as possible? What do pedestrians want to do? And how do we want our streets to look? And let's look at traffic lights that do that. For the longest time, I, I, up until really the last four years, nobody ever walked any place. That's Robert Saylor, the chief traffic engineer for Richardson, Texas, a commuter town that sees tens of thousands of cars pass through every day. I could time my signals with the assumption that, yeah, I'm not going to have any walkers here. And so even if I serve them, it's not going to mess up my signal timing, you know, because they're never there. Things worked great. But in Richardson, as in all cities, more and more people are taking to the streets. And every time a pedestrian pushes the walk button, cars have to stop. Everybody that drives is, is complaining, you know, my commute to work used to take eight minutes and now it's 18 minutes. Well, but <laughs> there's a reason for that. To keep commute times down, traffic engineers like Robert program their systems using traffic pattern models, usually based on commuting schedules. The way that, that a non-adaptive system works is we do traffic counts and we eyeball it and say, yeah, right about there is where we're going to change this, you know, 8, 9 a.m. or whatever. We just pick a spot. And so with a really heavy morning, well, maybe people are running a little bit later on Monday than they do the rest of the week. So I'm changing at 8.45 when really I should have held on to that longer period until 9.15 or so. But if Robert had a system that could adapt to actual traffic conditions, that would make his life a whole lot easier. What one of the adaptive systems would do is it's going to count cars and say, okay, if, gee, something's happening and and, people are having to work late, it can sit there and say, oh, it's 6 o'clock, but traffic's still really light. And and then when it sees it start picking up, oh, it's 7 o'clock, okay, boom, now it's time to go. But there's something else Robert would love his traffic lights to do, even more than count cars and people. Right now, the only way I know there's a pedestrian at all is if they push the button. (laughs) But there's a big difference between the jogger standing there jogging in place waiting for his walk signal so that he can run across the street versus the elderly lady with the walker that's trying to get across. They need different walk times and and, and different amount of time to get across. I could do that kind of adjustment in real time watching it, but I need to have a detection system that can tell, hey, did that person actually make it across in the time that I thought they were, or did they get stuck for some reason? Nobody solved the problem. (laughs) But Willa thinks she can help. She wants to build an adaptive traffic light that would allow traffic engineers like Robert to make adjustments in real time. So I like to think of it as the virtual traffic cop, actually. So, so an adaptive traffic light is like a virtual traffic cop? That's right. A traffic light that can understand the conditions of that intersection in real time and tell when someone wanted to cross the street and see where there were more cars coming this way versus another way that they would let those cars through first. That's actually the adaptive traffic light ideal. These virtual traffic cops might not be as far off in the future as you think. In fact, a few cities have already started experimenting with adaptive traffic lights. Like Detroit, which is where Vanessa is now. I'm here on this intersection. I'm at Larned and Griswold, just kind of like downtown Detroit here. And I have brought along my colleague, Ryan. Hi, Ryan. Hi, my name is Ryan Villam. I'm a software engineer here at Sidewalk Labs. And... I've been doing a lot of computer vision and machine learning. Okay, here we go! All right, we're going. We're on the road! (laughs) Okay, so the lights look like just normal normal traffic traffic lights. lights. Right, so like, is there any way that you would know that they're they're, they're adaptive? Uh, No, actually. 
what you could see is a tiny camera somewhere. Like you see right here, uh, just above that light and to the left. What, what's, what do you think is happening in this camera right now as it's got its um, lens on the, on the street? What it should be doing is tracking the objects that move through the intersection and classifying them. So classifying people and cars and buses and trucks and bikes and everybody who's using this bit of public space. Okay, so that white SUV over there, how does the camera know that it's a car and not a bus or, or a person? So there's a few things. First of all, the camera itself doesn't know an SUV from a piece of sidewalk. It just sees the video footage as a bunch of numbers. But an adaptive traffic light can combine those numbers with parameters that were set ahead of time. You may have heard of this process. It's called machine learning. Okay, yes, I have heard of machine learning. Um, but how did the machine learn exactly? Uh, this was done by showing the computer many, many images with boxes and classifications over and over again. At the start, it'll do its best guess and say, oh, I think this thing's a car, and draw a box there. And its best guess at the start is going to be, like, terrible. Okay. <laughs> but there's this mathematical way to quantify how terrible. Okay. And because you've quantified the terribleness or goodness of its guess, it can nudge itself into making its guesses better. Mm -hmm. And eventually it gets really good at it. Cool. So then it's, it has machine learned the difference between cars and people and sidewalks. Yes. Once you get the parameters from your machine learning algorithm and combine them with numbers from the video footage, the traffic light can now draw boxes around each object. Mm -hmm. The SUV, the person, whatever, correctly. Okay. But asking it to draw boxes around all the trucks in this picture is relatively expensive. And so oh. if you're going to do this in video, when I say expensive, I mean computationally expensive. If you're, oh. you're going to do this in, in <laughs> sorry. sorry, sorry, sorry. Computationally expensive just being like it's really hard for the computer to do it. Yeah, yeah, so it has to do a lot of operations. So if you're going to do this in a video in real time doing these object detections, like draw boxes around all the cars in this video, it requires a lot of computer power. Previously, you had to beam all this up to the internet for big computers to process. You couldn't fit all that computer into a camera. But now there are these new chips that are really lightweight and can do this really, really efficiently and very, very cheaply. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so these new chips, they allow you to do this in real time. Exactly. If it has to run a second behind, that's also not very helpful. Yeah. Because if you want to slow down the green light to let mm -hmm. the slow walking person mm -hmm. cross the street safely, yeah. a second behind is like not an acceptable amount of delay for that. Yeah, so um, like this person with a rolly bag. Yeah, they've exactly. Got, they've got like five seconds. I don't have oh, much no. time. How much time? Two seconds. <laughs> go, go, go. The good drivers of Detroit didn't, didn't kill anyone here. Uh... Welcome back. Glad you're still in one piece. Me too. <laughs> okay, so I have to ask about these lights. It seems like the cameras are pretty fundamental to how they operate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you need the cameras to know what's happening, see what's happening in real time. Right. So obviously you have cameras, you've got privacy implications, you've got privacy considerations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And this is something that cities are already dealing with. I mean, there's there's cameras all over intersections already. That's true. They're there for things like detecting speed violations, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What those cameras are doing is they're generally broadcasting all of that footage into some sort of central location somewhere where a local agency is going to monitor it. And that's not the ideal way to go about it. You're potentially broadcasting sensitive information that way. Okay, but then how do you get around that problem, right? Because the video is fundamental to the system. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, Ryan explained to me that we have these new chips, these like super fast processing chips that can analyze information in the camera really, really quickly in real time. And that actually really addresses this privacy issue. Because you're not sending out raw video footage. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you never have any video leave the device, you're not storing people's image, you're not tracking them. It's kind of like a supermarket door. You know, you walk up to the door, the door opens. It doesn't need to take a picture of you. It doesn't need to know who you are. It just has a job to do and it does it. And so you can think of these cameras like just more complicated supermarket doors. They have a job to do, and they do it. Okay, but we have to tell them what their job is, right? Ultimately, cities make the decision as to how to act on that information because the cameras can't act themselves. So we build the system based on what matters to us. Yeah, it means cities have some decisions to make about who gets prioritized at the intersection. Do you want to prioritize green lights for emergency vehicles like ambulances? Maybe delivery trucks so that you can get that Amazon package like stat. Uh, but who should get the green light? It's a Big question. Right. Not everybody can get a green light at the same time. No. But with these adaptive traffic lights on major streets, people could have something close. They're called green waves. And Willa's a big fan. Green waves are fun. 
So they just talk about waves in general, right? So you can kind of picture a wave and it's breaking, you know, as it rolls in towards the shore. And there's a surfer right on top of that break. And as long as he's riding that, he keeps going. But instead of a surfer, it's a car. And if a car was traveling at the city speed limit, they would just hit green light after green light after green light after green light. So cool. Yes, yes. So you don't need any special equipment for it, aside from timing the traffic signal in such a way that allows that to happen. And so with these new lights, you'd be able to create green waves in real time. So it's not just for cars anymore. Like, could you have green waves for bicycles too? Yeah. They're doing some of that in Europe right now. And the way that it works is... You're riding along a particular bike route, and there will actually be a series of green lights that are moving with you. If you travel as fast as those green lights move, so you're always within that green band, then you are assured that you will never have to slow down or stop. As a cyclist, that sounds amazing. If I never had to stop and like slowly gear up at every light, I could just fly to work. I'd get here in like 15 minutes with green waves. Like, that's crazy efficient. I mean, it also sounds way safer. I mean, if there's green waves, you get a lot more people to ride their bikes to work. Yeah, that's one good thing. The second good thing is it's, it's a way to sort of platoon certain groups of people so that you create these pockets where like cars can go and then pedestrians can go and then bikes can go. So if you can stay in that green wave, you can be relatively assured to be free of conflicts with other modes. With the traffic lights we have today, cars, people, bikes, they're constantly in conflict. The adaptive traffic light keeps the peace. It can respond to actual conditions, coordinate traffic in real time, give buses the green light. Cities will no longer have to choose between safety and efficiency. We can have both. Thank you for listening to City of the Future, a podcast from Sidewalk Labs. Your hosts are Vanessa Quirk and me, Eric Jaffe. We are produced by Benjamin Walker and Andrew Calloway. Mix by Sharif Youssef. Many thanks to those who helped us make this episode. Robert Saylor, Willa Ng, Ryan Villam, Sven Kreis, Taylor Wisner, Kara Oler, and Claire Mullen. Our art is by the great Tim Cow. Our music is composed by Adam James Levine Arity. If you want to hear more of Adam's work, you can check out his band, Lost Amsterdam, at AmsterdamLost.com. To learn more about Sidewalk Labs, visit our website at SidewalkLabs.com, where you can subscribe to our newsletter at the bottom of the page. See you in the future.